A big welcome, everyone, to the Evidence-Based Hair Podcast. This is Season 5, Episode Number 1. The Evidence-Based Hair Podcast was created for the hair loss practitioner. It was created for all those who wish to dive into the fascinating and ever-changing world of hair loss. It was created for practitioners around the world who care for people with all different types of hair loss. Each week, I'll review a handful of research studies that are changing how we think about hair loss. I'll introduce them to you, help you make sense of them, and give you my thoughts on how a given study just might change how we diagnose or treat hair loss. These are studies in androgenetic hair loss, alopecia areata, telogen effluvium, traction alopecia, trichotillomania, scarring alopecia. These are studies in all different types of hair loss. The Evidence-Based Hair Podcast was produced by the Donovan Hair Academy. The podcast was created to help all those who help all those with hair loss. It was created for educational purposes and shouldn't be considered a substitute for medical advice. The third Monday of each month is dedicated to studies in scarring alopecia, and today it's my great pleasure to review with you five studies. For those of you who want a five to ten minute brief overview, a mini podcast within our longer podcast, well, we'll begin that in just under 60 seconds. And for those of you who want a bit more detail, detail that helps you figure out how to incorporate these studies into your own practice, well, you and I will dive into these studies in just a minute. Thanks so much for joining me on this incredible journey. We'll begin first by a study by Lim and colleagues in the Clinical Experimental Dermatology July 2023, looking at disease associations in lichen plano pilaris. There's been a lot of interesting studies over the past few years looking at what diseases do patients with lichen plano pilaris develop? And some really landmark studies date back just a few years ago. Connick and colleagues in 2021 showed that, wow, patients with LPP are at increased risk to develop high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease, heart attacks, atrial fibrillation. And last year, we reviewed a study by Joshi and colleagues showing that Patients with LPP are at increased risk for psoriasis, atopic dermatitis, skin cancer, rosacea, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease. And so here we have a new study by Lim and colleagues, clinical and experimental dermatology, showing that patients with LPP, when they are diagnosed with LPP, have a greater chance of having lichen planus, psoriasis, atopic dermatitis, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, and in the years following their diagnosis are at increased risk to develop those same conditions as well. And we'll take a look at this very important study. Then we'll look at an interesting study by Joshi and colleagues in the International Dermatology, International Journal of Dermatology July issue, which was a systemic, systematic review and meta-analysis looking at the relationship between lichen plano pilaris and hypothyroidism. There's been several studies in the literature looking at this topic. Are patients with lichen plano pilaris more likely to develop hypothyroidism or less likely to develop hypothyroidism? Well, Joshi and colleagues dug up seven studies, including four showing a positive association, one showing a positive association that wasn't statistically significant, and one showing a negative association that wasn't statistically significant. But overall, their very nice meta-analysis shows that there's almost a two-fold increased risk of having hypothyroidism if you have lichen plano pilaris. And we'll look at that study together. Then we'll look at a really nice study by Dr. Senna's group from Boston, which was a systematic review of side effects of hydroxychloroquine, which you may know as Plaquenil published in the International Journal of Dermatology in April. This particular study examined 10 studies in the literature of 389 patients. So what are the side effects published in the literature regarding hydroxychloroquine? Well, 88% of patients had no side effects in our published literature, but the top five side effects were skin rashes, GI side effects, pigmentation, headaches, 
and lab abnormalities. And we'll take a look at this very nice systematic review by Dr. Senna's group. And then we'll dive into a nice study looking at the genetic basis of frontal fibrosing alopecia in males. Rayinda and colleagues in the Journal of Investigative Dermatology from May. This is a really nice follow-up study to really a landmark study in Nature from 2019 looking at four genes that are associated with frontal fibrosing alopecia. HLAB, CYP1B1, ST3GAL1, and SEMA4B. That was a nice study of, of those four genes and how they convey a slightly increased risk of developing FFA if you have those particular uh, gene types. HLA-B seems to be the most important gene, conveying about a five-fold increased risk to develop FFA, followed by CYP1B1. And we'll take a look at this study now in males. The 2019 study was in females. And this new study in the JID in males showing that HLA-B and CYP1B1 seem to convey an increased risk for males to develop FFA. But those other two genes, which were associated with female FFA, don't seem to be so relevant in males. And so we'll take a look at this really nice study. We'll take a look at what these genes may do. And then finally, we'll look at a really nice study of the prevalence and incidence of FFA a study in the journal Life in June 2023. And there was two prior studies in last year, year before, looking at the incidence and prevalence of LPP1 by Trager showing a prevalence of 1 in 6,666 in uh, people living in New York, and a study by Lavian showing an incidence of 1 in 18,000. And now we have a new study by different authors looking at the prevalence and incidence of, L of frontal fibrosing alopecia. How common is this condition? Well, in Spain... These authors show that the prevalence was 1 in 632 and the incidence was 1 in 6,464. I think this is really important. We need data, obviously, from different parts of the world and we need independent research um, for all the research that's done in the world. But I think this study is really important because it highlights that, wow, the prevalence of FFA, at least in this part of Spain, uh, may be much higher than we've really given thought to, and the incidence may be as well. And studies in insulin incidence and prevalence are challenging to do. There's a lot of assumptions and a lot of errors uh, and limitations in these kind of studies, but wow, if the prevalence of FFA is 1 in 600 in this part of Spain... That could be one of the highest incidences of the prevalences of FFA anywhere in the world. And so we'll take a look at this study together and, and highlight and summarize what this data might mean. So thanks for joining me on these on this season five, episode number one. Let's dive in now, beginning first with a study by Lim and colleagues titled Prevalence and Inci Incidence of comorbid diseases and mortality risk associated with lichen planopilaris, a Korean nationwide population-based study. This was a study in Clinical and Experimental Dermatology, July 2023. These authors have been looking at this Korean database over the last few years, and so this is a Second study, a follow-up type study to some of the work that this Korean group has been doing. But before we dive into the study by Lim and colleagues, let me remind you about some really important studies that come before. A study by Connick and colleagues in the JEADV in 2021 was really an important study. It was a huge study. And what Connick's study showed is that there was an increased risk of 
hyperlipidemia, high blood pressure, obesity, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, coronary artery disease, atrial fibrillation, and heart attacks. And this was a really important study. Other studies that came before, even studies by these same authors, were much smaller and had different conclusions, actually. But this is a very, very large study with a very large database and really highlights that patients with LPP are at increased risk for metabolic syndrome, heart disease. And a study by Joshi last year, which we reviewed together on the Evidence-Based Hair podcast, showed that indeed there's lots of these disease associations in lichen plano pilaris. Joshi and colleagues used this database known as the All of Us database, and they showed that patients with LPP are at increased risk for psoriasis, atopic dermatitis, skin cancer, rosacea, arthritis, lupus, inflammatory bowel disease, ischemic heart disease, as well as hyperlipidemia, hypothyroidism, high blood pressure, anxiety, depression. And some of these associations were not small by any means. You know, 47-fold increased risk of psoriasis, 27-fold increased risk of atopic dermatitis, four, five-fold, six-fold increased risk of skin cancer. So really important studies in our scarring alopecia literature highlighting that there are these important associations with lichen plano pilaris, particularly heart disease, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, all these metabolic syndrome risk factors, as well as psoriasis, as well as arthritis, as well as inflammatory bowel disease, as well as skin cancer. So really important studies. Now we have a study by Lim and colleagues in clinical and experimental dermatology, July 2023, looking again at some of these associations. And here they're looking at uh, lichen plano pilaris, prevalence and incidence of comorbid diseases. And what they showed in this particular study is that at the time of diagnosis, patients with lichen plano pilaris are indeed at much higher risk of being having had in the past associated lichen planus, a fivefold increased risk of having at the day of diagnosis a history of lichen planus a history of psoriasis, atopic dermatitis, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, allergic rhinitis. And after diagnosis, in the follow-up period, again, an increased risk of having a new diagnosis in the future of lichen planus by tenfold. Psoriasis, a threefold increased risk of coming to be diagnosed with psoriasis in the years ahead. Atopic dermatitis, systemic lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, allergic rhinitis, hypothyroidism, and low vitamin D. So not only are these diseases more likely to be present on the day that one is diagnosed, but these diseases are also more likely to be diagnosed in the years ahead. So a really helpful study, which reminds us of the importance of these disease associations. Again, highlighting several important issues such as lichen planus, psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, um, thyroid disease, low vitamin D. And so I think these are really important because they remind us that when you're seeing a patient with lichen plano pilaris, that your history can't stop at the scalp. Tell me about your eyebrows and eyelashes and your scalp hair. We know that a proper history has to include, do you have joint pain? Do you have diarrhea? Do you have fatigue? Do you have, you know, sleeping problems? Do you have all of these systemic issues have to go into a proper history for LPP. And I think these studies remind us of that. These studies by Connick, these studies by Joshi, and now these studies by Lim. Uh, 
that LPP is, has truly these systemic associations and we need to be aware of them. And we need to, as a society, as a group of practitioners that care about patients with hair loss, think about you know, what conditions are important to think about, what conditions are important to screen. These are the early days of thinking about this, but do patients with LPP need ECGs to screen for cardiac disease? Do patients with LPP need baseline cholesterol, uh, blood pressure measurements, um, lipid measurements, blood sugar measurements? Well, probably the answer is yes, but these are the early days and clearly uh, not all of us are on the same page, but the data is pretty clear that there are these increased risks for these various conditions. And uh, now is the time for us to start thinking about how do we care for patients with LPP. And as dermatologists or family physicians or cosmetic physicians or trichologists or surgeons, um, you know, we may not have the skills to think about all of these comorbid conditions. Um, you know, how do I screen for diabetes and blood pressure and cholesterol and inflammatory bowel disease and uh, lupus and rheumatoid arthritis? I agree it's a challenge, but what we need to be aware of is that these conditions exist, that a patient with LPP is at increased risk for high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, heart disease, inflammatory bowel disease, rheumatoid arthritis, so that when you take a history and you come to understand that, wow, this patient in front of me who has lichen plano pilaris and I would like to start topical clobetazole and I'd like to start steroid injections and maybe I'm going to start a systemic agent like hydroxychloroquine, they're telling me that they're quite fatigued they're short of breath. They find it difficult to, uh, you know, walk a certain distance. Uh, maybe I'm going to make sure that I direct that patient or direct the patient's primary care physician to encourage further cardiac workup in that patient. Or a patient who's sitting in front of me with LPP who has joint pain. That perhaps I'm going to say, you know, I've come to learn that there are these associations with LPP. I don't know if this is rheumatoid arthritis that you have. I don't have the skills to fully assess for rheumatoid arthritis, but you know what? I think you should see a rheumatologist. I don't know if your diarrhea is related to irritable bowel syndrome or celiac disease or inflammatory bowel disease. But you know, I've learned that there are these associations and I'd like you to see a gastroenterologist. So these associations are important. And one of the reasons we're talking about them today is so that you can come to be aware of them so that you can direct your patients to the right practitioners. So we move now to a study by Joshi and colleagues in the International Journal of Dermatology, July 2023, fresh off the press, titled Association of Lichen Plano Pilaris with Hypothyroidism, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis. I really like this particular study. It reminds us of the important association between lichen plano pilaris and thyroid disease. Several studies in the past have examined whether patients with lichen plano pilaris are at increased risk to develop hypothyroidism. Some studies have suggested yes, some studies have suggested no, and some studies have suggested that there may be even a reduced risk of developing thyroid disease in patients with lichen plano pilaris. And so Joshi and colleagues looked at this issue in further detail by performing a systematic review and meta-analysis. So the authors 
looked at various databases, including uh, Embase and Medline databases, for key terms such as comorbidities, hypothyroidism, lichen planus polaris, thyroid. They wanted to look at all the published literature which addressed this issue. Are patients with lichen planus pilaris at increased risk for various types of thyroid disease? And so they included in their study all the case control studies from the past that examined the prevalence of lichen planus pilaris, and other types of studies were excluded. And so there were seven studies that they ultimately included in their meta-analysis. They found four studies that reported a positive association between LPP and hypothyroidism. There were two studies that had a positive but statistically insignificant association. And there was one study which showed a negative but statistically insignificant association between LPP and hypothyroidism. But overall, when they crunched all the data from these seven studies, their meta-analysis showed that there was an increased risk by about twofold of hypothyroidism developing in a patient with LPP compared to controls. The odds ratio was 1.75. And so I really like this study. Patients with LPP seem to be at increased risk to develop hypothyroidism. And the study reminds us of the importance of testing for uh, thyroid levels, at least a TSH, in patients with lichen plano pilaris. The reasons for this association, of course, are not clear. It could be that patients with hypothyroidism and LPP share very similar pathways involving dysregulation of T cells, but we don't really know. We know that patients with one autoimmune disease are at increased risk for a second autoimmune disease. But why it is that this particular association exists, it's not clear. We don't know if patients with more severe LPP are more likely to develop hypothyroidism compared to patients with less severe uh, LPP. We don't know if patients with certain subtypes of LPP have different risk. For example, do patients with FFA have different risk? Do patients with Graham-Little syndrome have increased or decreased risk? Do patients with fibrosing alopecia in a pattern distribution have different risk than classic LPP? But nevertheless, a nice study highlighting this important association. We move on now to a study by Izema and colleagues. This is from Dr. Senna's group from Boston, published in the International Journal of Dermatology, April 2023, titled Adverse Effects of Hydroxychloroquine Use in Patients with Cicatricial Alopecia, a Systematic Review. I really like this study. It, it highlights the side effects that we really should be aware of and talk with patients about if you're about to prescribe hydroxychloroquine. Hydroxychloroquine is commonly referred to by one of the popular brand names, Plaquenil. Hydroxychloroquine is commonly used to treat scarring alopecia, including lichen planus pilaris, frontal fibrosing alopecia, discoid lupus, pseudopallad, and others. It tends to be reasonably well tolerated, although several side effects can occur. And I think what's important for us all to be aware of is what are the side effects that are reasonable to counsel patients about? Is it reasonable to counsel patients about retinopathy? Well, it sure is. Retinopathy, as we've talked about in prior episodes, is not all that common, but 1% or 2% of patients after 10 years on standard doses may develop a retinopathy. With screening, of course, we reduce that risk, but it's appropriate to talk about retinopathy. What other side effects are appropriate to talk about? Well, changes in blood counts, pigmentation changes, rashes, um, changes in blood counts. These occur with enough of a frequency that it's important to talk about. But Izema and colleagues performed a systematic review of all the studies in the literature looking at 
what are the side effects that are most commonly reported in the literature with hydroxychloroquine? And uh, they looked at the studies specifically in patients with scarring alopecia. There were 10 studies that they pulled up in this systematic review. These were eight retrospective chart reviews, again, looking at patients with scarring alopecia. So if it was a study looking at the use of hydroxychloroquine in systemic lupus, then it wasn't included in this study. Eight retrospective chart reviews, one randomized controlled trial, one case series was included. A total of 389 patients were included in this particular review. The average age of patients was 56 years, 83% of patients were female, and 81% of patients had LPP or FFA or a combination. And the hydroxychloroquine dose ranged from 100 to 500 milligrams per day. And as we will see, some patients were overdosed with hydroxychloroquine. What was really interesting in this systematic review is that 88% of patients reported no adverse effects from hydroxychloroquine. So that's really important. A very, very large percentage of patients who are prescribed hydroxychloroquine do really well and they, do, they don't develop any side effects. So what are the most commonly reported side effects in patients with scarring alopecia? Well, the most common side effects were skin reactions in 4%, gastrointestinal problems in 4%, skin hyperpigmentation in 2%, headaches in 1%, visual changes, retinal toxicity in two of those 389 patients, or 0.5%, and then lab abnormalities, shortness of breath, dry eyes, and cardiovascular effects were seen in 0.2% of patients, or 1 in 389 patients. So certainly, these are the more common side effects that are reported in scarring alopecia patients. And so we worry a lot about retinal toxicity in patients with scarring alopecia, and this is a topic that we'll come back to many times on the podcast The American Academy of Ophthalmology has published really important guidelines, and they've been revised recently, stating that we must keep the doses of hydroxychloroquine at 5 milligrams per kilogram per day or less, and not to exceed 400 milligrams per day. And so for very light patients, a typical dose could be 200 milligrams per day. And so there still are many practitioners around the world who are of the belief that the dose of hydroxychloroquine is 400 milligrams a day. Well, that's true for patients that are 180 pounds, 190 pounds, but that's certainly not the dose for someone who's 100 pounds. And so we need to adjust the dose based on weight. And 5 milligrams per kilogram per day is a reasonable dose not to exceed 400 milligrams per day. And so two of the patients in this study who developed retinal toxicity were receiving doses above that 5 milligrams per kilogram per day dosing. There was one patient who developed non-sustained ventricular tachycardia 17 months after starting hydroxychloroquine. This patient had several heart problems before she started hydroxychloroquine. And so it certainly is possible that some of these heart problems that developed were due to pre-existing heart disease as opposed to being solely attributable to the hydroxychloroquine drug itself. And so the study reminds us that many patients do really well on hydroxychloroquine. After all, 88% of patients don't seem to report any side effects. But the top, side, the top five side effects that you certainly should keep in mind are rashes, GI problems, gastrointestinal problems, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, pigmentation issues, headaches, and lab abnormalities. And certainly these should be included in your typical counseling that you do of patients.
And so I think that's really important when I sit down with a patient who's about to receive hydroxychloroquine, we certainly talk about the possibility of eye side effects, rashes, GI side effects, pigmentation changes, um, brownish discoloration around the face, changes in liver enzymes, changes in uh, blood counts that could develop with hydroxychloroquine. And um, I also sometimes mention rare neurologic side effects as well. And so before we leave hydroxychloroquine, I just wanted to spend a moment talking about 10 strategies that I often share with trainees that you might want to think about to keep hydroxychloroquine as safe as possible for your patients. So let's run through these briefly. The first is to be sure to keep the dose less than 5 milligrams per kilogram or 5 milligrams per kilogram. Remember, you're not obligated to use 5 milligrams per kilogram. And so if I have a patient with lichen planus pilaris who's doing pretty well on topical steroids, steroid injections, doxycycline, and you know some other treatment, and I feel like I need a little bit of help. I don't feel like I need full help, but they're not perfectly controlled. I need some help. Well, I might start at a dose of two milligrams per kilogram per day. It wouldn't be uncommon that I might say to the patient, your maximum dose is maybe 300 milligrams a day. But I'd like to start you on 200 milligrams three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Let's see how you do. Let's see if the scarring alopecia can be controlled. And if not, we might raise the dose. But I'm going to start you on a slightly lower dose and we'll see how you do. We'll see you back in three, four months. So we need to get out of the habit, certainly, of assuming that we must start five milligrams per kilogram per day. And remember, we, we also need to get out of the habit of assuming that the dose is 400 milligrams. For very light patients, the dose may be 200 milligrams per day. The second tip is to ensure that you do baseline labs, especially CBC, uh, and liver enzymes. I always order an AST and an ALT. And sometimes in a patient that's a little bit older, I might do a potassium and a magnesium and a calcium, and we'll come back to that in a minute. But at least an AST, ALT, and CBC. And these lab enzymes should be repeated after starting the drug. Very rarely you get changes in hemoglobin and white blood cells. It's not common, but you can. And very rarely you get a hepatitis, a bump of liver enzymes. Again, it's not common, but if you don't test for it, you'll never know. And we need to get the baseline eye, eye examinations. And the eye doctor will tell you when they want to see the patient back. The new guidelines from the American Academy of Ophthalmology are, if a patient has no particular risk factors, then it's not unreasonable to do your second eye examination in five years. But if a patient's a little bit older, um, there are other concerns, some eye doctors will say, I'll see you back in a year or two. We'll do another eye exam and we'll see how things are going. Please get those baseline examinations. And for blood tests, you need to get another blood test a month or two after starting. My third tip is please keep an ongoing log of how long a person's been on hydroxychloroquine. I'm seeing a patient, 56-year-old patient with lichen plano pilaris are on hydroxychloroquine. This is year three. Time flies when you're seeing patients, and if you're seeing a patient on hydroxychloroquine and it's year eight, I think it's important to ask yourself, wow, they've been on this medication eight years. Do we really need to be on this medication any longer? The chances of side effects, including retinopathy, increase the longer and longer you're on the medication. Not only does retinopathy increase, but chances of pigmentation issues increase. For patients with androgenetic hair loss, you need to be on minoxidil lifelong. For patients with scarring alopecia, you don't need to be on hydroxychloroquine lifelong. If the disease has become quiet and inactive, then certainly we can start thinking about stopping these medications. And it's not uncommon to be on hydroxychloroquine for 
one and a half, two years, three years, four years. But it's not super common to be on this medication five years, eight years, 10 years, 20 years. That's not really what we should be thinking. And so unless you keep that log, it's easy to escape your mind how long a patient's been on it. My fourth tip is to be careful about using hydroxychloroquine in patients over the age of 65, and especially over 75 years of age. Side effects increase. And in my experience, patients over 75 are are more sensitive to this medication. And so if I'm seeing a slightly older individual, even if they're very healthy, there's lots of healthy 75-year-old individuals, we have to respect that I'm probably not going to be anywhere near that 5 milligram per kilogram dosing. And I'll use as low of a dose as possible if I need to. If I can control the disease with topical steroids, steroid injections, the use of pimecrolimus or tacrolimus, um, then those are going to be my go-to agents. But really respect the dose in patients over 65. Be aware at all times of other um, coexisting diseases, especially liver disease and kidney disease, and of course, eye disease. But you really want to take a good history. If there's any kidney disease or liver disease, I'm going to be careful about using hydroxychloroquine, and I'm going to be probably asking the kidney doctor or the liver specialist, hey, I'm going to uh, consider using hydroxychloroquine in this patient. Um, it might be a letter, it might be a phone call, but it might be that, you know, I see this patient has mild kidney disease. I understand that you've uh, been seeing this patient for many years and the disease is pretty controlled. Would you have any issues if we used a low dose of hydroxychloroquine? Or I see this patient uh, has some very mild liver disease. Liver enzymes have been well controlled. Um, uh, would you have any problems if we started hydroxychloroquine? We'll, of course, follow the liver enzymes. And if there's any issues, we'll, of course, uh, stop or change the dose. You know, 98 times out of 100, the kidney specialist or the liver specialist says, absolutely, let's go for it. Um, and often there's no issue in, in mild kidney disease or liver disease, but you need to have on your radar that if there's liver disease or kidney disease or eye disease, that you have that sense of tremendous respect for this drug and um, consult your colleagues. And remember to be very careful about using any medication in patients on any medication. And I think when you start prescribing medications, whether you're a experienced physician or trainee, that you be very aware of the possibility of drug interactions. And every day I use these wonderful websites that allow you to punch in the name of drug one, punch in the name of drug two, punch in the name of drug three, and see if there are any interactions. There are many free websites where you can look if there's any drug interactions. And there are drug interactions with hydroxychloroquine. I think that's very important to be aware of. Don't use hydroxychloroquine in patients on tamoxifen, the antiestrogen tamoxifen. You increase the risk of retinal toxicity. Don't use hydroxychloroquine in patients on drugs that prolong the QT interval. The QT interval is this uh, measurement that you can see on an EKG. And if the QT interval becomes longer and longer and longer, you increase the risk of a very serious and potentially fatal rhythm disturbance called torsade de point. Um, and you need to be aware that there's many medications, including heart medications, amiodarone, sodalol, certain antibiotics like ciprofloxacin, levofloxacin, erythromycin, clarithromycin, antidepressants like the SSRIs and the TCAs, the tricyclics like amitriptyline, antipsychotics like risperidone, Haldol, 
as well as certain anti-emetics, uh, um, odansetron, certain migraine medica medications like sumatriptan, as well as other medications, including certain antihistamines like hydroxyzine, as well as diuretics like Lasix and hydrochlorothiazide that prolong the QT interval. And by using two medications that prolong the QT interval, you increase your risk of this serious rhythm disturbance called torsade de point, which can then precipitate a very, uh, very serious arrhythmia. And so hydroxychloroquine, even though it's well tolerated, is one of these medications that very, very rarely prolongs the QT. It's rare. And in fact, Dr. Senna recently published uh, another very nice study looking at um, the QT interval in patients on hydroxychloroquine, showing that, you know what, this medication is pretty safe and it doesn't tend to prolong the QT interval all that much. But when you use hydroxychloroquine, you need to have in your mind, oh, this medication is one of these medications that can prolong the QT interval. I wonder if this patient is on any medications that already come with an increased risk of prolonging the QT interval. Because if they are, I'm not going to use hydroxychloroquine. So I'm concerned about using hydroxychloroquine in a patient on an antiarrhythmic drug, a patient on SSRIs, a patient on a tricyclic antidepressant, a patient on certain antihistamines like hydroxyzine, ebastine. And I'm concerned about using hydroxychloroquine in a patient with heart disease that uh, you know may already have a, a slight possibility of heart rhythm disturbance. So I think you just need to have a healthy respect for hydroxychloroquine. And if you have a healthy patient, uh, you often have very few side effects. But if your patient has heart disease, back up a minute and say, you know what, I'm not comfortable with this. I'm going to ask the heart doctor, hey, is there any problem with starting hydroxychloroquine? If the patient has kidney disease, back up and say, you know what, is there any problem starting hydroxychloroquine? If the patient has liver disease, back up and say, hey, any problem? Any eye disease, a patient with any eye disease. There are many eye diseases that you're not comfortable with. Back up and say, dear ophthalmologist, is there any problem with starting hydroxychloroquine? And so I think it's just having a healthy respect for hydroxychloroquine, and many times it's just fine. But you uh, need to have that healthy respect for medications that prolong the QT, a healthy respect for uh, eye diseases, liver diseases, kidney diseases that may preclude the use of hydroxychloroquine. So consider a 56-year-old male with lichen plano pilaris. Past history includes depression. We know there's an increased risk of depression with LPP. So you're going to see lots of patients with LPP and depression. The patient is on an SSRI, citalopram. Guess what? Citalopram prolongs the QT interval. Hydroxychloroquine may not be your best option. You're seeing a 46-year-old, 48-year-old female patient with lichen plano pilaris. Her past history includes fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia is fairly common. The patient's on amitriptyline for fibromyalgia. Guess what? Amitriptyline is a tricyclic antidepressant, which prolongs the QT interval. Not a great choice to start hydroxychloroquine. You're seeing a 51-year-old female patient, super healthy, has lichen plano pilaris, has a little bit of hypertension, is on hydrochlorothiazide. Guess what? Hydrochlorothiazide prolongs the QT interval. Hydroxychloroquine, not the best choice for this patient. So, point number seven, be careful about using hydroxychloroquine if there's any pre-existing heart disease. And if there is pre-existing heart disease, guess what? The patient probably has seen uh, a specialist. And if they have not, 
then it's probably mild enough that they have a history um, through the family physician of, of being monitored for their heart disease. But if there's a pre-existing heart disease of any kind, it's not unreasonable to say, you know what, I'm not comfortable starting hydroxychloroquine until we ask a cardiologist. Nothing wrong with that. But certainly get, a, get an EKG, an electrocardiogram, and get an electrocardiogram after follow-up. And if the EKG is not perfectly normal, then you may want to have the patient see a cardiologist before you start hydroxychloroquine. Now, when you speak with a cardiologist, a cardiologist may say, you know, Jeff, you go, you, you go overboard about some of this stuff. It's fine to do this. It's fine to do that. It's fine to do that. That's okay. Over time and experience, you will come to realize that, you know what, it's fine with this situation and that situation. But I think it's very reasonable to have in your mind that if my patient with scarring alopecia has heart disease, I'm going to just get an EKG, ask a cardiologist, hey, am I going to be able to use this hydroxychloroquine or I'm going to use some other medication? It's fine to have in your mind, you know, if my patient has kidney disease or liver disease, I'm going to ask a liver specialist and a kidney specialist before I use hydroxychloroquine. Nothing wrong with that approach. I think we have to remember that our colleagues are available to help us. Point number eight, be careful about using hydroxychloroquine if there's pre-existing retinal disease. And so if there's retinal disease of any kind, I'm certainly not going to use hydroxychloroquine unless the ophthalmologist gives the okay. And in fact, that extends to many eye diseases. And so um, many times the ophthalmologist says, it's fine to use this medication with this eye disease. And you know, sometimes there are some obscure eye diseases. I don't even know what this is. And the eye doctor writes back, no problem, Jeff, go for it. That's, that's just fine. There's no issue here. That's fine. I feel all the better. Patient feels all the better. Um, and so do remember that. Point number nine, please monitor for pigmentation. Dr. Senna's study reminds us that pigmentation issues is one of the top five studies, top five side effects of hydroxychloroquine in scarring alopecia patients. It's not unreasonable to get baseline photographs of the face, of the cheeks, of the temples, of the neck, and to monitor for pigmentation. You know, some of this pigmentation that develops with hydroxychloroquine can be pretty subtle, and it can, it can come on over, over many years, and patients can be unaware of it. And unless you look for it at visits, and unless you're monitoring for it, you'll miss it. And the reason it's helpful to monitor for it is because if you spot pigmentation from hydroxychloroquine and you stop the drug, sometimes you can get some reversal, not completely, but some reversal of the pigmentation. But if it goes on for many years, it can be quite difficult. And patients aren't always aware of this pigmentation happening. And finally, consider limiting the medication in patients with uh, certain electrolyte abnormalities, including um, consistent problems with magnesium, potassium, calcium. That's just a rule that I have. Now, most patients have just fine magnesium, calcium, and, and potassium levels. But we certainly know that potassium, magnesium, and calcium abnormalities do increase the risk for uh, prolongation of the QT and, and rhythm disturbances. And so if a patient has you know, issues with these electrolytes, especially if they're a little bit older, um, I'm just going to have a little bit more of a healthy respect for hydroxychloroquine. And that is why in someone 50, 60, 70, 80, I'm probably going to get a potassium, calcium, and magnesium level. In someone 32 with lichen planal pilaris, you know, I'm probably not going to get a magnesium and a calcium level. Of course, if I think about it on the day, maybe I will, but it's certainly not front and center on my mind. But in someone 50, 60, 70, I probably will. And so the lab tests that I generally get pre-baseline are CBC, 
AST, ALT. I'm going to think about, should I get an EKG? I'm going to make sure I send the patient off for an eye exam. And I'm going to think to myself, maybe I'll get a potassium, calcium, and magnesium, depending on the clinical scenario. I'm going to order a cholesterol panel because we know patients with LPP are at increased risk for metabolic syndrome. I'm going to order a blood sugar. I'm going to make sure the patients have their blood pressure measured. Um, I'm going to think about ordering a, a creatinine. And um, those are the typical blood tests that I order in a patient with uh, LPP. And of course, ferritin uh, and TSH are in there as well. So we move on now to a study by Rayinda and colleagues in the Journal of Investigative Dermatology, a really important study titled Shared Genetic Risk Variance in Both Male and Female Frontal Fibrosing Alopecia. Published in the JID May 2023, a really nice study, which is a follow-up study to this landmark study in 2019, which we'll get into. Now, FFA occurs in males. Out of every 100 patients with FFA, probably 95 are women and 5 are males. That depends on your clinic, your practice. But FFA is increasing. And it's increasing in women and it's increasing in men as well. In 2019, researchers from the UK and Spain created a whole big deal of excitement when they published four genes that seem to be associated with FFA in women. They studied 848 FFA cases and they compared those to 3,700 unaffected controls from the UK. And there was a group in Spain in that study which compared 172 women with FFA to 385 controls. And they found four genes that come with an increased risk of FFA. These were HLAB, CYP1B1, ST3GAL1, and SEMA4B. Now, HLA-B0702, or what they called HLA-B on chromosome 6, was found to have the strongest association. And there was about a five-fold increased risk of developing FFA if you had HLA-B0702. And HLA-B is part of the major histocompatibility complex, and it's one of these so-called immune recognition genes. And this gene appears to have a key role in how antigens are uh, presented, particularly how follicular antigens or hair follicle-related autoantigens are presented to the immune system and how stem cells come to be destroyed in the bulge region. And this HLA-B was associated with a full fourfold, 4.73-fold increased risk of developing FFA. And so if you had this particular gene variant, it meant you were at a fourfold increased risk of 4.74 increased risk of developing FFA. Didn't mean you were going to develop FFA, it just means you're at a 4.7-fold increased risk to develop FFA. CYP1B1 was the second runner-up gene that conferred a slightly increased risk to develop FFA. CYP1B1 is a gene that codes for a metabolic enzyme that's involved in sex hormone degradation. It is a microsomal enzyme. It's known as the xenobiotic monooxygenase or the aryl hydrocarbon hydroxylase. This gene is responsible for how estrogen gets metabolized in the body. And this gene also plays an important role in the hydroxylation of testosterone and progesterone. And if you had this particular gene variant, you had a 1.65 increased risk of FFA in females. The two other genes were ST3GAL1 on chromosome 8, which was a membrane-bound sialotransferase. This particular gene influences changes in glycans on the surfaces of T-cells that influence the activity of T-cells. 
And if you had these particular variants, you had a 1.3 fold increase risk of FFA and SEMA4B, which is a membrane protein involved in the nervous system, had a 1.5 fold increased risk of FFA. So these four genes conferred an increased risk of women developing FFA. So now we have this study by Rainda in the JID 2023 looking at male FFA. Do any of these four genes have any relevance in male FFA, or is male FFA its completely own entity? It would be surprising if male FFA was its completely own genetic entity because of how similar it is. So the authors set out to investigate the genetics of FFA in males. And what they found is that HLA-B and CYP1B1 have a key role in male FFA. But lo and behold, the other two genes, ST3GAL1 and SEMA4B, did not. And CYP1B1 had a 2.36 fold increased risk in males, and the HLA-B had a fourfold increased risk. So it's a really nice study, a much needed study as we continue to understand how FFA comes about, and as we continue to understand what genetics is relevant, and how does this tie in with the supposed environmental risk factors that are out there that are influencing, influencing this disease as well. And so this particular study concludes that HLA-B and CYP1B1 play a key role in male FFA. And the authors acknowledge that their study is somewhat limited in its power to detect effects of magnitude similar to female FFA. So it's possible, albeit very unlikely, that other genes, that these other two genes have a role, that it seems that they do not but the authors acknowledge some of these limitations. And finally, we talk about a very nice study by Carmona Rodriguez in the journal Life from June 2023, titled Frontal Fibrosing Alopecia, an Observational Single Center Study of 306 Cases. I really like this study because it, in addition to looking at many characteristics of FFA, it looks at the prevalence and the incidence of FFA in this very specific region in Spain. So before we dive into this study, I'd like to remind you about two studies from 2021, which we've talked about before on the Evidence-Based Hair podcast, a study by Lavian in the Dermatology Online Journal, and a study by Trager, in the JAD 2021, or Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology. The Lavian study looked at the incidence of FFA and LPP, and the Trager study looked at the prevalence of FFA and LPP. Those two studies propose that the prevalence of FFA is about one out of every 6,666 patients, and the incidence of FFA is about one in every 18,458 patients. And so here we have a study by Carmona Rodriguez addressing the prevalence and incidence of FFA as well as other issues. This was a retrospective observational study in this specific hospital in Real, Spain. And all patients were diagnosed with FFA between 2010 and 2021. Now, this particular hospital sees patients from this encatchment area with about 200,000 people. And so that is their denominator. That is this population that they service. Now, these incidence and prevalence studies are challenging because, you know, is it possible that somebody comes from outside of this area to the hospital for uh, medical care? Yes, it is. And is it possible that other people with the disease go elsewhere? You know, maybe your son or daughter lives in, uh, you know, 
800 kilometers away or 200 miles away, and you don't go to this hospital, you go somewhere else. Um, and is it possible that somebody else in my family or my friend comes to my hospital, um, even though it's thousands of you know kilometers away? So it is possible, but nevertheless, this is the data. Um, and so the total population here is... Um, 193,881. And so the authors here calculate that the prevalence of FFA is about 1 in 632 people. So 101 out of every 632 people in this area in Real, Spain, have FFA. That's pretty remarkable. And so you go into a neighborhood where you'll probably find 632 people, there's probably one person there that has FFA. And one out of every 6,464 people are going to develop FFA this year. That's the incidence. So pretty remarkable. These are much higher than previous published studies where we have one in 18,000 incidents in the Lavian study and one in 6,666 in the Trager study. And so this study by um, uh, Camora Rodriguez suggests that the prevalence and uh, incidence of FFA may be much higher than we previously appreciated, at least in this area in Spain. I really like these studies of prevalence and incidence. It's really important to understand how common are these diseases, but how do they change over time? If the prevalence of FFA in a particular city or country skyrockets suddenly, then it certainly suggests that, wow, some kind of environmental trigger is happening in that particular area. Um, similarly, if the disease prevalence, the disease incidence reduces dramatically, then there's a suggestion that, you know, something's happening that's reducing this. And so I think it's really important. The product ingredients in products we use changes over time in our cosmetic products, in our foods, in our beverages. Um, Climate is changing, environmental factors are changing, viruses are changing, infections are changing. And so I think it's important that we come to understand over time how the incidence and prevalence of these diseases are changing. And the data here suggests that, at least in this area in Real, Spain, that FFA might be more common than we realize. And it's certainly possible and in fact, pretty likely that different parts of the world have different prevalence and incidence of FFA. And so the prevalence and incident, incidence of FFA in um, East Africa is undoubtedly different than in Spain or New York City or in Iceland or in uh, New Guinea. And so I think we really need to understand that and continue to understand this. But if this data is accurate, this is a pocket of the world in Real Spain that seems to have one of the highest, if not the highest so far, uh, incidences and prevalences of FFA that we know so far. And so that's it for this week. I want to thank you so much for joining me. We've reviewed some very important disease associations in LPP by a new study by Lim and colleagues. I reviewed the Connick and colleagues study from 2021, the Joshi study from 2022, and now this Lim study from 2023, showing, showing these associations with lichen planus, psoriasis, atopic dermatitis, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, hypothyroidism, we talked about the relationship between hypothyroidism and lichen planus pilaris, the study by Joshi, with the systematic review and meta-analysis of those seven studies showing the 1.75-fold increased risk of hypothyroidism in patients with lichen planus pilaris. We talked about the side effects of hydroxychloroquine, the systematic review by 
Dr. Senna's group of 10 studies, 389 patients reminding us of those top five side effects. Skin side effects, GI side effects, pigmentation, headaches, and lab abnormalities, as well as retinal issues. So certainly those side effects should be incorporated into your general counseling of patients and perhaps other side effects as well. And I gave you 10 tips to help make hydroxychloroquine prescribing as safe as possible. And then we talked about the genetic basis of FFA in males and the HLAB and the CYP1B1 gene uh, being associated with male FFA just as it is in female FFA. But ST3, GAL1 and SEMA4B not being associated with male FFA. And then we talked about FFA incidence and prevalence in a very nice study from Real Spain showing a prevalence of 1 in 632 and an incidence of 1 in 6,000. And if this is indeed true, we have a pocket in Spain with some of the highest prevalence and incidence of FFA that we know so far. And so that's it for this week. We're back next week for season number five, episode number two of the Evidence-Based Hair Podcast. I would like to say if you're currently seeing patients with hair loss, be that if you're a dermatologist, family physician, plastic surgeon, cosmetic surgeon, or if you're a dermatology resident, dermatology registrar, plastic surgery, family medicine trainee, and you'd like to dive into this field with some more depth and some more intensity, perhaps to take your expertise to a whole new level, then you might consider joining me for an intense 15-month training program known as the Evidence-Based Hair Fellowship. We'll be announcing those details on August the 1st, 2023. It's been quite an long-awaited training program that we've been developing, but a program which seeks to provide in pretty intense training to those individuals that would like to become uh, experts in, in the medical treatment of hair loss at quite an intense level. A limited number of spots will also be reserved for non-medical trichologists as well as non-physician researchers at the PhD level. More details are coming on August the 1st, 2023, but I just wanted to make those announcements now and we'll announce it again next week. But the Evidence-Based Hair Fellowship will launch in January 2024 and we'll be announcing that on August the 1st. You can hear those details on the Donovan Medical YouTube channel and we'll of course be discussing that further here in August and beyond. Thanks so much for joining me today. I hope these five studies will be helpful to your practice, perhaps change your practice in some way. Look forward to seeing you back here next week. It'll be the fourth Monday of the month of July, and we'll be talking about a potpourri of different studies in the field of hair loss, which again will be fascinating and interesting and I hope will be of great value to you. Thanks again for joining me. We'll see you next week. Bye for now.